goal is to grow and evolve spiritually and to reach higher levels of consciousness and coherence and to be of service to the world by improving ourselves, right? And, and serving the highest good for all. And so our lives go in the same direction in a parallel fashion because we're both going toward the same destination. And I think that's a, that's a problem I've had in business. It's a problem I've had in friendships, in romantic relationships, is there's compatibility, but you don't share the values that really shape your life or shape a business, like the why. Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It is my pleasure and honor to have Luke's story with us. Luke was on my other show on Get Yourself Optimized, a two-part episode, which was phenomenal, all about biohacking and sleep hygiene and some metaphysical, spiritual stuff. And that was just awesome. Well, he's back and this time on this show to talk about marketing because he has become such a tour de force in the in the podcasting world. He has now surpassed 12 million downloads. His podcast is The Life Stylist. It's top rated. It was launched in 2016. Luke is a motivational speaker, meditation and metaphysics teacher, and a lifestyle design expert. He shares transformative principles of health and spirituality. Luke spent the past two decades refining the ultimate wellness lifestyle. His teachings combine primal health and ancient spiritual practices with the most cutting edge natural healing and consciousness expanding technologies. He's been featured in the Hollywood Reporter, Los Angeles Magazine, Men's Fitness, and he's appeared on numerous TV networks, including Style Network, VH1, and MTV. Luke, it's so great to have you on the show. It's great to see you again, man. As you were reading that, I, I was thinking, man, we go back a long way. You know, I, I, I must have been, I don't know, nine, nine, ten years ago or something, I feel like, when we met. Because when we met, I hadn't started my podcast, which began in 2016. So, yeah, we've, we've had a long, long journey in both kind of parallel paths of doing content marketing and providing value for people in the world uh, through social media and podcasts and all the things. So yeah, it's good to see you. Do you remember how we met or who we, who we met through? Yeah. I believe the first time I met you, you were a speaker at one of Neil Strauss's intensives. Yep. That was 2010, if you can believe it. Oh, so it was that so long ago. Holy crap. Yeah. I, I believe it was in downtown LA in a hotel, if if I recall right. Does that sound right to you too? That's right, at the standard. And you know, it was one of those synchronicities, crazy synchronicity. Oh, crazy is not the right word. Miraculous, beautiful synchronicity. <laughs> I had just met Neil in person maybe a couple months earlier at Tim Ferriss's uh, event called Opening the Kimono, where he was showing all his secrets to getting a, a big book deal and he shared his his book proposal that he submitted and got the four hour work week and then the four hour body as a second book deal and so forth. And it was phenomenal. Neil was there. He was a speaker and attendee and gave me uh, his contact info. And then I just happened to hear at the standard, I was there for a book launch party just randomly, not random because nothing's random, but the bouncer guy who was manning the elevator happened to mention out of the blue, do you know who Neil Strauss is? Because he just went up that elevator. <laughs> I'm like, I happen to know uh, Neil Strauss. Yes, I know of him and I know him. And so I, I texted him and I said, hey, I'm actually at the Standard Hotel. I understand you're here. And he's like, yeah, I'm running a mastermind. Why don't you pop by in the morning and say hi? when uh, the mastermind's running. And I did, and he's like, hey, why don't you, I was in the back of the room, and he's like, hey, why don't you go up and speak? I'm like, really? I don't have anything prepared, but okay. And I did, and <laughs> that's, uh, that's how we met. <laughs> that's funny, I didn't know the backstory on that. Yeah, I just remember you and your transformation story, of which I'm a huge fan, of yours and all transformation stories, because I've, I've had my own that was pretty dramatic too. And uh, I remember thinking, man, I got to get this guy to do my SEO. I'm doing everything wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, that, that was my takeaway. I was like, oh my God, this is a whole other world that I know nothing about. And I feel like if I don't learn, I'm going to lose. Yeah, that was, that was my takeaway. That's funny. Yeah. 
Well, FOMO is usually something that you want to turn and run away from. I learned that in Kabbalah, <laughs> but uh, in this case, it, it worked out well. We, we, we did. I actually uh, remember us sitting down together and I was sharing a bunch of SEO advice uh, for your previous company, uh, School of Style. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we must have done something right. And now you've, you've sold that company. Yeah, that was uh, that went down about three weeks ago. Yeah, I founded that business in 2008. In 2020, when I moved, uh, well, I, actually, I moved to Texas in 2021. So I guess it was the beginning of 2020. I bought out my former partner. I tried to get her to buy me out and we couldn't come to terms that were agreeable. So I bought her out. And then essentially, um, I didn't close the business in like, um, you know, folding the entity itself, but I just put like wait lists on the website and I stopped selling those online classes because they had become outdated and I didn't feel that I could ethically sell that content anymore being outdated because it's a essentially a trade or business school. And so I've been sitting on it for the past couple of years and just going like, I know it's, it's a very profitable business and could be even more so with some muscle behind it. And I just could not motivate myself to fire it up uh, because it's just not the subject matter is not it, it's not based in an industry for which I have any passion or interest. <laughs> I have experience and knowledge, but I'm not interested in it. And so it was a really cool lesson in that sense um, in learning about myself that I, I'm not the type of person that can be happy having a business or career just to make money. And that isn't like our virtue signal. It's, it's just literally the truth that there's, if I'm not interested in something or passionate, passionate about something, I just, I literally can't do it even if it pays well. <laughs> you know? And so I kind of, yeah, I sat on that business and then um, was courting some viable buyers that I felt strongly about that I felt they could really be successful and they, they had the experience and the passion. Uh, but I kind of had to wait it out and it was a nail biting experience because on paper, the business generated zero revenue for two years. And it was just essentially the IP of the business and the legacy of the business that I was trying to sell. And I wanted to sell it for a decent amount of money because I knew the potential of how much revenue it could generate if somebody fired it up and did so wisely. So yeah, I just, I, my friends are like, oh, just sell it to someone else. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, how, how, do you, how do you present, you know, a seller's memo or a pitch deck to sell a business and then it all looks good and they want to see the financials and the financials all read zero <laughs> for two years, you know? So it, it was quite a journey, but uh, yeah, that, that brings back a lot of memories to, you know, all of the things I learned along the way, having that business that was... Um, it was never a brick and mortar business, but it was a live seminar business for many years. And then in 2018, I transitioned it into a 100% online business. And interestingly enough, that's when it became, I mean, exponentially more profitable because the margins doing the live classes were not great. And the margins, I don't know what, what they were in terms of actual numbers, but the margins were much, much better selling online classes than they were live classes. But by the time that happened, I had really lost interest in the business. So it was like, you know, one of these things that, again, could have been very profitable, but I just couldn't drum up the passion. Uh, so I, you know, used my resources for the business that I have now, which is essentially my own personal brand. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's amazing. And what a great example of the universe conspiring to make your dreams happen. You didn't want to be in that business anymore, but you also didn't want to just shut it down completely and have all that effort and, and, um, IP go to waste. And so, yeah, out of, uh, thin air comes uh, the opportunity. Totally. Yeah. And part, and part of that IP is some of the stuff that we worked on with SEO, you know, a lot of it had to do with just the systems and automation, which I know nothing about in terms of hands-on, uh, you know, work. I'm more of like having ideas and vision and then hiring people to do the nuts and bolts of it. But a lot of the value in that business was just 
you know, all of the various software and the ways in which that software connects and all of the uh, marketing strategies and social media accounts and all that stuff that had been built over all of those years. So even, even sometimes in the process of selling that business, I'm like, is it really worth this, you know, this price tag because it doesn't make money and you have to, you have to recreate all of the content. I mean, you know, the curriculum for all of the classes you, you could still use, but you have to reshoot all the video and make it relevant to uh, the current industry standards and things like that. But I realized when I started to dig through the the back end of the business that it it really had become a plug and play operation where if you had someone that knew how to, that had the industry knowledge of the fashion industry, which is what that business was, teaching people how to become a fashion stylist, someone who dresses other people uh, for their career. Um, if I had someone that understood the business in real time and someone that had the marketing power of some big influencers and so on to to push that content out that they'd be very successful and so the intrinsic value of that company were the systems um and really the infrastructure of it so that someone could just essentially reskin the website put up new content put a new face other than mine that's been divorced from the fashion industry for many years now and hit the ground running. And thankfully that's what they're doing. It's, it's fun. Now I'm consulting with them for the first few months to help them, you know, get on, get their legs under them. And, uh, and they're going to do great, you know, and I'm going to be sitting back going, <laughs> I, I'm sure for a minute going like, oh man, maybe I should have kept it because I just know they're, they're going to be so successful. They're, they're going to make a lot of money. They'll be able to pay me back. I would say in the first six months of business, once they're operational maybe even less. I mean, they could have one launch and pay me back really, if they really did it right. Mm -hmm. Well, good for yeah. you and good for them. Yeah. That's fabulous. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. And I've been watching your trajectory with your personal brand and your lifestyleist podcast. And it's just phenomenal. You have such great guests. You ask such great questions, really. It's a beautiful unfolding and I'm really happy for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's I'm, I'm sure you and your listeners are familiar with this experience. It's I mean, and it's true of personal development work, too, is that it's difficult to objectively track one's progress when you're always focused on your future objectives and goals. So like a guy like you sitting on the sidelines, watching the the growth of my brand and, and the reach that I've been able to achieve. You're like, wow, damn, he's really done a lot. I'm sitting here at my desk every day going, ah, oh, God, how come I'm not Joe Rogan yet? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever metric of success, but it's, it, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because I'm always driven to achieve more and grow and reach and help more people. Um, but sometimes I, I lack the habit of, of really looking back and going, wow, man, I've, I've really come so far, you know. And uh, yesterday I recorded an episode for my show with my wife, Allison, and we met in 2017 when she was a guest on my podcast when I was recording some shows out in New York City. And in and we listened back to the podcast to kind of, uh, you know, do an update, right? All these years later, here we are married. Who would have known? And in that podcast, I said, I had only been doing it for a year and she was like, Hey, congratulations. You know, you're doing really well. And I, I remember saying, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't know if anyone was going to listen to this thing, but I've got a million downloads. <laughs> and I was like, I can't believe people listen to my podcast, you know? And now looking back, I go, Oh my God, I've come so much further than that now, you know? But, uh, yeah, I, I find that something that is really important to do, whether it's, you know, your own inner journey and your own personal growth or, the growth of your business or success of your company. It's, it's really important sometimes to, with humility, take a look at where you came from and where you are now and give oneself and great spirit credit for how far you've come because it's it, it that treadmill of success can really wear you out if you always feel like, oh, okay, the next goal, the next goal, and you don't stop and actually acknowledge all of the success that's been built uh, on the journey so far. So true. And now looking back at those early years when you had only only a million downloads and you just had Allison on your, your podcast and, and and all the all the magic unfolds after that. 
does it feel like it was destiny like you and she were already kind of uh, in a soul contract to be soulmates and and that your business was destined predestined to get to the size and even you know and, and, and even larger into the future does it feel like this was just part of an unfolding that was already written in the stars i mean yeah i've i've not thought about i've thought about that in terms of the relationship but in terms of the the work i do and and my business and brand um i mean my last name is story right it's like it's like if if i was named luke shoemaker and you know at 40 five years old, I discovered, you know, I wanted to be a cobbler or something, you know, and it's like, yeah, I was definitely, I was definitely destined to tell stories and to, and to share other people's stories. And, um, I, I think the, the, the sense of purpose and alignment I have now versus earlier in my life and other businesses I've had and other careers and whatnot, um, and some of them were exciting and creative. I mean, I was a fashion stylist for many years and worked in Hollywood with all these celebrities. And I mean, on paper, it looked like a pretty sexy career, but I sort of just fell into it and I didn't have any other skills or education. And I was able to carve out a decent living doing that. And it was a you know respectable career path to most people, but it wasn't really in alignment with what my true mission as a person here on earth is and i think what makes what i do so satisfying now and something that i'm you know i I really never lose my gratitude for this is that for the most part the things i do in business are things that i would be doing anyway for free (laughs) you know I would be having conversations with brilliant people like you and people that I interview on my podcast. I would be speaking on stage, sharing my experience and some of the wisdom I've gained from that experience. Uh, I would be practicing all of the meditation techniques and biohacking practices that I employ in my life. I mean, this is how I've been living for over 26 years. And I, I think I just it took me a minute to realize that I could actually create a career out of it. And I I saw some other people doing that and they were kind of my lighthouses where I thought, well, I don't know if they can do it. Maybe I can do it in my own unique way. So yeah, I feel like I was, I was destined to do what I'm doing now. I can't really imagine doing anything different. I mean, the only thing that seems somewhat appealing to me, I mean, if I was financially stable enough and had managed, you know, to, to get a decent portfolio together and some really stable passive income, I would like to live somewhere remotely and just grow food and have a family and just work on my homestead. I love farting around around the house. And then that's kind of what I do during breaks from work. I sit at the desk, I go do a podcast and then I go in the backyard and I try to grow some plants or fool around with the landscaping. I mean, I just, I love I love being at home and I love being outside, um, but I'm not a particularly interested in fitness. I'm not a huge outdoors person. You know, I don't go mountain climbing. I just like to kind of hang out outside uh, and be in nature. And I think that's the only thing in my career now that that I would change is just the ability to actually just be out in nature more and uh, and just explore. But uh, yeah, I feel like this is what I was meant to do, and I, I, I think over the past eight years, some of those things have changed because you don't really know what aspect of your business in terms of um, monetization are going to be enjoyable. So for example, in the very beginning, because I saw my peers doing this, I started a coaching program and I I really built out this whole program and a really great kind of um, intake process. I built all these systems around it and I had one client and I just felt like I have a job. I don't want to have a job. (laughs) So I stopped doing that. Um, So there, I'm sure there could be at some point, I do a lot now on social media. I work with uh, 130 brands. And so I do a lot of affiliate marketing and things like that. And sometimes that's kind of exhausting, just continually producing content. And so I can see that would be something eventually I'd be like, okay, I'm going to move out of that. So I'm writing a book now, which I really enjoy. And 
I could see my life for some time, you know, with the work that I'm doing, merge more into writing a book every couple of years versus spending so much time in the uh, minutia of all this promotion and stuff. Um, in terms of the destiny of my relationship, you know, it's funny when we met that first day and had that interview. I mean, I, it's the first time I, you know, met her, I was somewhat aware that she existed. We had, were both speakers at an event in New York, which is how I found out who she was. And, uh, I thought she was very attractive for sure, but I, and unbeknownst to me, she as well were, were both, uh, celibate at the time I was taking a break for, it was almost two years for me. I was having a lot of issues with uh, relationships and codependency and just was very lost in that part of my life just due to my childhood and just unhealed parts of myself that were manifesting as really destructive patterns. And so after one breakup, I said, you know what, I'm out like there's something wrong with me. I'm I'm the common denominator in all of these relationship dramas. <laughs> you know? so it's like you can only blame the partners for so long. It's like, who's the one that chose them? And I look in the mirror and find that that's me. So when I met her, you know, I was taking some time off. So I didn't flirt with her. I mean, it, it was I was my boundaries were very strong and very clear. And she felt that after I got to know her, she actually said she was doing the same thing. She wasn't dating. She was celibate for an even longer period of time. So there was no hanky panky or any kind of intrigue between us. But what there was between us was a profound level of comfort and safety. I just felt really at ease around her. And that was not generally the criteria by which I selected a mate to pursue. My criteria was, do I feel really high and scared and nervous around this, this woman? Then she's the one I'm going to go after, you know, because um, I valued kind of excitement more than I valued safety. Uh, but that, that, that craving for excitement also um, equated to a lot of pain for both parties and in many cases over the course of many years. But I, I do remember a sense of safety with her. I remember feeling very comfortable and very connected. And we were both celibate. I lived in LA, she lived in New York. So there was nothing to really build from at that time. But the funny thing about it in terms of destiny is numerous people reached out to both of us separately on our own channels, social media and whatnot, and friends that heard that podcast and said, wow, man, you guys really have a vibe. You, are you going to go out? Like you guys are obviously, you're, you're a thing. There's something there, you know? And we were both kind of like, doo, 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 doo. We did, you know, we did, just weren't aware of it because we were so boundaried, you know, and had our, um, you know, we're so respectful of the, the dynamic of the relationship being one of uh, profession. And, and later we became friends. Um, but yeah, everyone else kind of knew before us. But now looking back, I mean, it's so, it's beautiful. It's the orchestration is beautiful because I do believe that fate and destiny brought us together and allowed us to have that 90 minute conversation that was very vulnerable. It was very intimate and very open. It just lacked the romantic intrigue. It was just like soul to soul, person to person, peer to peer, a warm interaction. And I think what is likely the case is that the universe source god whatever you call it or maybe our higher selves you know on some level knew that we had a shared destiny but that it also wasn't time for both of us we weren't ready for what we were uh, bound, bound and destined to experience so now the experience we have as a couple being married and living together um it's it's a very harmonious very aligned, uh, drama free, easy, safe, fun. I mean, I, I could have never imagined. I mean, really, I, I, this is like the, my relationship is the relationship I would see in a movie and go like, yeah, right. That's a movie that can't happen. It really is a beautiful, beautiful bond that we have. And, uh, we just have really great communication and more than anything, I think what makes it work. And this goes back to business and marketing is, in terms of thinking of any kind of a partnership, right, is we have aligned values. The, the moral code that we at least do our best to live by and the things that we value in life and the things that we work on within our own character individually 
are absolutely aligned and she has her, you know, she has her own flavor. She's a shaman and I don't know what I am, <laughs> maybe some sort of quasi spiritual teacher or personal development leader. I really don't know how to market myself very well in terms of that because I'm always changing and I'm into so many different things, but we each have our own, you know, I guess individual belief system and worldview but the goal is still the same. And the goal is to grow and evolve spiritually and to reach higher levels of consciousness and coherence and to be of service to the world by improving ourselves, right? And, and serving the highest good for all. And so our lives go in the same direction in a parallel fashion because we're both going toward the same destination. And I think that's a, that's a problem I've had in business. It's a problem I've had in friendships, in romantic relationships, is there's compatibility, but you don't share the values that really shape your life or shape a business, like the why, right? The why in a business, you might have a business partner and their why is to make a lot of money and your why is to change the world. And so you might be compatible in the way you like to run a business and the the shape and forms that business takes but where it's going in the long term is like you know two ships starting out on the shore right at a dock and the rudders are just ever so tilted in either direction and eventually as it crosses the sea they're in totally different locations you know and so uh yeah there, there's definitely a, a shared destiny and alignment but man it took it took a lot of patience and a lot of open-mindedness and and a really open heart for me to be able to see, wow, this person that's been my friend for a few years, I think I'm supposed to ask her on a date. And that's what eventually happened. And I did. And then, you know, all, all of my preconceived ideas about the way a healthy relationship starts and the way it goes, they were all thrown out the window and it was a totally unique and unpredictable bond that, that was formed. And it, everything about a relationship has been completely unorthodox, completely unplanned just in complete service to surrender and the unknown and allowing us individually and as a couple to be guided to where we are now, which is, as I said, a really very healthy, integrated, aligned, supportive relationship. And, and, you know, and I, and I like to, you know, I know we're, we're talking about the marketing and business, but all of these principles, hopefully that I'm, that I'm sharing today, because they're principles and universal truths, at least from my experience, they are. Uh, everyone, you know, will have their own interpretation. But these are things that also carry over into business, very much so, because everything is relationships, right? It doesn't matter if if you're having sex with the person with whom you have a relationship, whether it's a friendship or business relationship. All of these things matter, and they matter to the success of the endeavor, and they matter to the longevity of the endeavor. And I've learned this the hard way in all of those different areas and all those types of relationships. But everything is about how we relate to other people. And all of our success is contingent on the harmony of those relationships because of the inertia that is created when people join forces together with a common purpose. And so if our common purpose is just to make a bunch of money in our business and we don't care who we hurt and who we roll over in the process, it'll probably be very successful. I mean, look at our multinational corporations, right? All the shareholders are like, we don't care about ethics. We want to make money. And they do, right? And then you have companies who are set out um, motivated by their ethics and motivated by making a contribution to humanity and they might be less successful financially, but they're successful in their shared mission. And so that's, that's kind of how I think of things is what, what are our immediate goals? What are our midterm goals, but ultimately, and strategies and tactics and all of that matter, right? But they're going to be informed by where do we want to get at the end of this thing? And what's the true purpose behind it? What's the capital Y capital W Y that's uh, a yeah, very profound and uh, related to that concept of a shared destiny, I learned from Anne Marie Pizarro. I took one of her courses and it was on how to become an Akashic Records reader. I didn't want to make that my business to you know, take money for doing uh, Akashic Records readings, but I, I did learn a lot from her. And one of the things that really stuck out from a business perspective is to not see your customers 
as customers or clients as customers, but to see them as your assigned group. So the, that shared destiny, that preordained uh, soul contract of, okay, this is going to be a client of your get through whatever struggle they're going through or learn some powerful lesson or uh, get some insight that is going to be pivotal in their life. That's preordained. That's, that's uh, part of, of the movie of your life. And so that takes a lot of the pressure off and you just allow and you trust and, and, and divine grace just takes you to where you're supposed to be and you land the clients that you're meant to land. It's just really powerful. And, and as a corollary to that, I learned this from uh, another guest. So Anne, Anne was also a guest on my other show on Get Yourself Optimized. Another guest on that show, Curtis Lee Thomas, who's a breathwork expert, told me this incredible story of how God became his business partner and everything changed for him from that point on. And uh, I, I loved that. So I asked God to be my business partner and he said, yes. And now I don't have to run around from conference to conference doing speaking gigs several times a month like I used to. Clients uh, come to me like manna from heaven. And it's, um, it's an allowing, it's a trusting, and it's also a collaboration, a co-creation with the creator because it's his business. It's not my business. I'm just stewarding that business. And that's been a game changer for me. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's very much in alignment with my path too. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, let's talk about some of the kind of nuts and bolts of uh, of, of podcasting and growing uh, your reach and, and brand and all that. So let's first of all start off with your uh, approach to doing a great podcast episode. Um, I've noticed that you like to do these interviews in person and that's not typical for most podcasts. They're usually on a platform like this, like Riverside or zoom. And, you know, that makes it a lot easier to uh, do podcast episodes with people who aren't in your same city. So why, why is it so important to you to do in-person episodes? You know, <laughs> I, th I think that is really part of my secret sauce uh, is that I've really put in a lot of effort to do them in person. And I don't think that physical distance is real, okay? Because of everything emanating from the quantum field, like consciousness doesn't have location, right? So you and I might have a slight delay in what we call time right now because we're talking to each other over the internet but we're sharing energy, we're sharing space, we're connected, right? Maybe as much or at least close to that which would be possible in person. So I don't think that remote podcasts are a facsimile of reality or a conversation or that you're not connected with the person. But I found early on that, uh, and it, part of it was just living in Los Angeles and part of it's now living in Austin. I'm, it's just easier than if I lived somewhere in a city where there weren't as many people I was interested in talking to. Uh, but there's, there's a magic that happens for me in person that translate to the, translates to the audience. And that magic has a lot to do with subtle nonverbal communication cues and energy, eye contact, micro facial expressions. I mean, all of this subconscious, I'm not sitting there going, oh, he blinked three times. Now I'm going to ask a question. But there's just a feeling when you're sitting in the same room with someone that allows for a deeper connection and more, more coherence in the conversation. It's like if I'm sitting down and talking to someone, say I'm interviewing someone and I'm going on a bit too long, I can feel when it's time to shut up because I can feel their energy. I'm just, I'm a really, also just a really sensitive person. I'm really high in empathy. I just, I'm sensitive to every little nuance. Um, 
And it seems to be that that particular gift, which is sometimes also a curse, <laughs> um, really sensitive people feel everything, even the things that aren't that pleasurable to feel. But I think knowing that that's a gift that I have um, and that that gift is much more applicable sitting in a room with someone in person made those experiences early on just much more enjoyable for me. And I found that the quality of the content was just a lot higher. It's just less awkward. There's less kind of, I don't know, awkward gaps in between who's talking and the cues are kind of off when you're online. When I'm sitting with someone and I get into a flow state with them and I can really, this might sound crazy, but this is just the truth. And this is happening now as I talk to you as well, but it's much more palpable in person. I am sending so much love to the person to whom I'm talking and I'm co-regulating with their nervous system. And I'm, if I'm the one doing the interviewing, I'm not only co-regulating the nervous system, I'm actually dropping them into a parasympathetic state by the coherence in my heart and the way that I'm breathing and the way that I look at them in their eye and the level of love that I have for them as a fellow human being who took the time to sit down and talk to me for two to four hours. You know, so my podcasts are rarely under two hours. Um, so there's, there's an energy exchange. There's, yeah, there's a magic that happens for me that not only makes it much more enjoyable for me, but I think, well, I don't think, I'm quite certain that the end product of content for the viewer or listener is of much higher quality when I'm able to do it that way. It takes way more time, especially when you're, you know, you're gonna do a two hour podcast. My video crew sets up for an hour and a half. You grab a coffee, you chit chat, you show them the bathroom. I mean, from start to finish, one podcast episode for me is probably four to five hours. It's like an all day thing. So it's definitely not the most economic in terms of time. And it's also expensive because I hire a video crew. Um, and right now we do them in my house in our in our loft, which is kind of our, our sacred ceremonial space in our house where we pray and meditate and, and do all those types of things. And so it, it's much more of an investment in many ways and more of a commitment. But the experience for me and for the guest, I think, is just so much more profound. And because I enjoy having conversations that don't have any confines of time, it's really exhausting for me to stare at my computer screen for two or three hours. It's just like I get done and I'm just exhausted. Uh, when I get done with an in-person podcast, yeah, I need to take a little break because I've been really focusing my energy for a long period of time. But it's a much different kind of um, fatigue than comes from staring at a computer and like sitting in a chair. Like I'm in my office chair right now. I have to shift around a lot. It's not very comfortable. <laughs> you know, I have these big cushy chairs in my podcast studio and I can sit a number of different ways and kind of stretch out and relax and lounge and it's it's really what my goal with recording podcast is to pretend like we're not recording a podcast and that we're just sitting having a deep conversation and deep conversations are really the only kind of conversations that I'm interested in having I'm exhausted by small talk and superficiality it's just not the way I work I just it's like we were taking a walk yesterday uh, down in the neighborhood and I love people, but I avoid running into our neighbors because I know we can't have a deep conversation. <laughs> they, they don't want to go there. They can't go there. There's no time to go there. So I'd rather just skip the interaction altogether. If we're not talking about something meaningful that's going to be transformative for either or both of us, I just don't have time for it. I'm not interested. Um, so I find the depth and the, the heartfelt intimacy, the vulnerability, the richness of conversations is is just not as likely and in some cases just not even possible uh, doing it over the computer. From a marketing standpoint, in the beginning, because I had no um, qualifications, no relevance, no public awareness of myself in the wellness space, 
I also saw the in-person interviews as social proof and clout. If I'm sitting down in a room with Joe Dispenza and we're chatting like old buddies, the optic of optics of that marketing wise are much more powerful than a Joe Dispenza throw me a bone and jumping on a quick 45 minute to 60 minute zoom and kind of going through the motions of answering the the questions in a rote fashion that he would answer on every single zoom one hour podcast, you know? So posting on social media with bigger names um, and, and, oh, and another huge part of that, not just the optics of that, but the relationship building is a huge part of, I mean, just the enrichment of my life, just from human to human, but also in terms of business opportunities, uh, opportunities to, uh, you know, work with different brands in a more meaningful capacity, uh, speaking engagements, you know, I might have someone on my podcast and then this happened with Joe Dispenza. Actually, we're both speakers at an event in uh, Georgia and, you know, there was a rapport there. We're both, we're peers now, you know what I mean? It's like when you sit down with someone, even if that person has more notoriety than you, when you're sitting in the same room, it's kind of an equalizer and you become related to them in a more peer to peer way than just being some guy that got a lucky break and someone agreed to do a zoom interview. It's, it's much more of a commitment for both parties. Both parties are more invested in it. And so the enrichment of the relationship and the possibility of that relationship blossoming into something um, more substantial in the future is much higher. It's not just like a hit it and quit it quick interaction. It's like two or three hours. We're having coffee. When my guests come over, we might jump in the ice bath afterward. I, I take them on a little biohacking tour. It's like we we hang out, you know? So it's like, you, I'm, I've found that I'm more likely to develop friendships and business partnerships and things like that when we're meeting in person because there's just more, there's more realness and there's just so much more intimacy. You can really get to know someone much better. And so, I mean, the people with whom I have relationships now, I mean, I'm, I can't believe it that the people that I can text, you know, the, um, the this morning, Dr. Will Cole, who's you know, a really well-known functional medicine doctor and personality and huge podcaster. He texts me, Hey, have you heard of this thing? Like I introduced him to two other doctors I know. And I know those other two doctors because of my podcast, you know? And so now we're friends, we're colleagues. And I don't know that that would have been the case if I just had Will Cole on my podcast and we had a quick chat and that was that I would have just been kind of another number and he might've forgotten about it. So, you know, the impact of those meetings and the opportunities for collaboration are, are huge. And, uh, and, and as I said, the, the cloud and the social proof, when people see that and the optics of that, of like, you're in the same room with someone puts you in the same category as that person. And that, that isn't so meaningful to me now at this point, but in the beginning when I was a nobody and I could have a David Wolf or a Neil Strauss or Dave Asprey, or any of these bigger names that I had on, it was like, oh shit, people watching that just think you're friends. Meanwhile, I might have had to beg a publicist or something to get that person to come over to my house and record a podcast. But once it comes out, the appearance of it is like, oh, shit, he's on their level, you know. And so marketing wise, that was something I was aware of in the beginning. And another way that I was able to achieve so many in-person podcasts, which was exhausting, by the way, and I don't recommend it, is I would go to every you know, spiritual conference, biohacking conference and so on. And I would just shoo my way in the door to get interviews with all the keynote speakers. And I would find a little cubby somewhere to set up all my video gear. And having video of a podcast too has been really powerful. I mean, I have much more listeners than I do viewers, but there are people that would never listen to a podcast that will watch a video. And they're much more likely, by the way, to watch the video if it's two people in the same room chatting than they are two people on screens. So I'd go to these conferences and um, I don't do this anymore because it's just exhausting. But another thing that I would do, I'm, I'm trying to give you as many of my trade secrets here as I can to offer value for the audience. Dude, I would, okay, I would have three video cameras for the YouTube video, for the proper edited, high quality, I'd have lights. And I still do that. I do audio and like high quality three camera shoot for every interview. But what I would do additionally for years in the beginning is I would bring tripods and a bunch of extra iPads and my iPhone, and I would live stream on Instagram and Facebook on three Facebook pages and Instagram all at the same time. 
And so it was just like a media blitz. Anytime, you know, Luke's story was going to do something, I would announce it on social media leading up to it. And I'd be like, here's all the different channels you can watch this in real time. And if you miss some of it, this episode comes out on such and such date and you'll be able to have quality audio and quality of video. So yeah, I'd go to these conferences and just set up all these tripods and cameras and just do sometimes up to six interviews in one day. I'd just be there all day and the end of the conference, people would say, Hey, how was the conference? I go, I have no idea. I'd never walked onto the floor once. I'm just recording the whole time. And you asked me when we started, if I was going to the Florida biohacking conference, and I'm like, it's too much work. Cause I just, if I'm, if I'm there, there's no way I can just go watch the speakers. I would rather be interviewing them and, and, um, banking content, you know? So it ends up just being so exhausting at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm eight years older than I was when I started and, doing six interviews in a day is, is much more laborious than it was when I started out and I was younger and more, had more energy and was hungrier, you know? Uh, so that, that's the, I think the main, the main reason that I, that I tend to do them in person, a number of reasons that I do it. And I'm actually always really disappointed when there's someone that I really want to have on my show. And the only way it can happen is by zoom. So it has to be for me to do a zoom it has to be someone that I really, really want to talk to. Otherwise I just won't do it. I'll just say, Hey, you know, hit me up whenever you come through Austin. I don't care if it's in two years, but I'm not going to do it on zoom. Funny story real quick. Uh, Gabor Mate is one of my favorite teachers in the space of personal development. You know, so much beautiful, elegant work around trauma and addictions, which I'm both of which I'm intimately familiar and so um, I forget who it was that someone introduced me to him via email, someone who's a friend or colleague. And was like, hey, you got to meet this guy, Luke. He's got a podcast. And we chatted back and forth on email a couple of times. And then I got handed off to his people. He's got a big team, right? And then my team started talking to his team. And it was out of both of our hands. And they set to schedule it. And we asked, you know, hey, can you come to Austin? He's like, no, I'm in Canada. I can't do that. It was during the whole COVID fiasco. And I was like, well, it's Gabor Mate, man. If I, you know... I, I got to do it even if it's on Zoom. We get on Zoom and uh, and the first time we'd met and we hadn't started recording. Hey, nice to meet you, Luke. He said, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm in Austin, Texas. He goes, oh, no way. I'm coming there tomorrow. I'm flying there tomorrow to do a bunch of podcasts. <laughs> so, so he comes and does Rogan and Aubrey Marcus and all these other big shows. And I'm just like, God damn it. If we would have sent one more email, like, are you sure he can't come to Texas? You know, I could have had him over to the house and served him a, a lovely tea and, 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 you know, we had a great conversation. It, it was a beautiful episode, but I know from experience, it would have been much more meaningful for both of us to sit down in person and, and also for the audience. It just, it would have been different. There's a, there's a different magic. So, you know, that happens sometimes. Too. I, I love these coincidences that are just not coincidences. Like yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> that was a lesson. Yeah. And yeah. And also it was, and I'm just going to be real here. It, it's always annoying to me. It's like the competitive part of me, which is not a part I'm proud of, but it is there to some degree. I, I don't really operate from it, but I have an awareness of the thoughts because I'm an observer of thoughts. I'm a long time meditator. When someone comes to town and does Rogan and R- Rogan puts them out way faster than I do. Uh, another recent one was Rick Rubin, who I did in person. I We were talking for three years about doing it. and I don't even know if he would done, have done it on Zoom, but I'm like, there's no way I'm talking to Rick Rubin on a computer. He's not a computer guy. So I was in LA and I recorded out at his house out there in Malibu uh, recently. But Rick and I had been talking about it and he's like, yeah, I'll do it anytime. And I'm like, wow, you know, he's a really famous guy and I'm little old me. I mean, I still don't really appreciate the reach I have or the the perspective people have on my podcast and its validity. Um, this is, I just can't tell. But he's like, yeah, of course, I'll do it. So he put a book out recently and I'm looking at my Spotify Joe Rogan feed, which I don't listen to all the time. But if there's a mean a guest that I want to hear, I'll listen to that guest. You know, like I'm listening to Andrew Dice Clay right now because it's just a hilarious Rogan episode. Open up my phone and there's Rick probably down the street from my house recording with Rogan. And Rogan puts it out and I'm like, God damn it. You know, I like, I I kind of have that journalist thing where I want to break a story, right? When I have a guest on who's putting a new book out or they're kind of reemerging into the public eye, like I'm really greedy about wanting to be the first guy that gets it out there because I I do think it has some punch. And so I missed that one. And I texted Rick. I was like, really, dude? 
<laughs> you're going to do Rogan? Come on. You know, I mean, obviously I'm joking and I understand why that would be a higher priority. I mean, he probably flew out on a private jet just to do Rogan, you know. Uh, I don't know if he flies private, but I'm sure he came out just for that and then left. So, yeah, sometimes that happens. And I'm I'm always a little secret, somewhat secretly disappointed if I don't get someone like a Gabor Mate or Rick Rubin, some of the other bigger names, or even someone that's not big, but someone who's just emerging and I know is going to be a big name, you know, like a Andrew Huberman, for example. Like I found him some time ago and I was like, oh, I got to get this guy on my show before he goes on all the other podcasts too late. Now he's on all the other podcasts and I still would love to have him on, but I'm less interested now because you can search your podcast app for Andrew Huberman and find 50 shows he's already been on. So it's like, ah, it's not as special to me. I want to be like one of the first or the first to really get someone's message out there. And, and, um, oh, there's one other thing I'll add too. And I'm sure you have other questions. I tend to be very verbose at times. I get passionate. I'm passionate when I, catch a thread. I'm like, ah, oh, don't lose this, Luke. This is good stuff. Um, another thing is in interviewing people in person is the likelihood of them sharing that experience with their audience and their friends is much higher because of the impact of your connection and because of the quality of the content, specifically the video. I mean, audio is always better in person too, but if you get a three camera shoot that's well shot and well lit and you deliver that content to your guest upon publishing, they are much more likely to repurpose that content and share it. So that's another part too, is just like having stringent uh, content quality principles. And I, I think that came out of just working in Hollywood for so long and knowing when something's well lit, knowing when something's well shot, knowing when the resolution's good, when the edit's good. I mean, I was in that business for a long time behind the camera and just kind of knowing how things are supposed to be to some degree. And so um, it's also just the the quality of the content and the shareability of it after the fact too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you choose guests that are going to uh, especially be the ones that are the, the breakout, uh, you know, you've discovered them <laughs> kind of guests. I encourage people to take this the right way. I'm not going to say this because I think I'm the shit. I'm going to say this because this is why my podcast is successful. I don't really take submissions, you know, like I think on our website, we have a form and it says every January 1st, we change it. I'll just let people in on the secret that have tried to get on my show. January 1st, we change it. In the beginning of 2023, it says, we're all booked up for this year. Try us again in 2024, and we'll do the exact same thing next January. I don't have people on my show that want to be on my show. you know. Um, God, and there's a lot of brilliant, talented people. Again, I'm not trying to... It, it, it might sound like arrogant or something. It's, it's, it's really not. I don't think I'm special. I don't think my show... Well, I'm special and my show is special, but not in that way. Like, oh, you don't deserve to be on my podcast. It's just the way I do it is I get this feeling inside. It's like this charm, you know, in my heart where I'm just like, ooh, I want to talk to that person. I want to talk to that person. And oftentimes some of my favorite episodes and even some of my most successful shows in terms of visibility and downloads are people that have never once even been on a podcast. But I meet them somewhere or I, I discover their content. I see them speak. I see them on social media. I, I meet them at an event and I go, holy shit, this person is really interesting to me. And if I invite that person on my show, regardless of their level of fame or notoriety, if I'm really interested in talking to someone from my heart, that conversation is going to be imbued with passion and interest. And that's going to translate to the quality of the experience for the listener or viewer. If I get a submission through my website and I'm like, well, they have a PhD and they wrote four books and I, I enjoy the topics they explore, they, I, they might be the most brilliant person ever. But if I don't get that feeling inside, then I'm going to be feigning excitement and feigning passion and kind of going through the motions of that conversation. And I don't want to have conversations that I'm not really interested in just any more than I want to talk to my neighbors who I'm sure are beautiful people, but on a, when you're walking the dog, you're not going to have a conversation about the meaning of life or consciousness or the quantum field or some new biohacking technology or whatever, right? 
So my criteria for booking guests is, do I feel that feeling in my gut? Do I feel that feeling in my heart where I'm like, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. I have to talk to this person, not because it's going to be a huge episode, but because I want to learn from this person and my level of curiosity about them and their expertise or their experience gets me excited. I have to be excited about it. And every once in a while, it's, not, it's really quite rare, but every once in a while we'll get a submission and I'll look at it and I go, shit, actually this person does look interesting, but that's very, very rare. I would say a slightly more frequently is we get a submission and it's actually someone I've heard of and someone that I was already interested in talking to anyway. And I go, oh, great. I was like, I'm out fishing and the fish just jumped in the boat. Yeah, great. Book it. You know what I mean? You know, someone's publicist, right? Of a, An author or something that, you know, their publicist, the person doesn't even know they're pitching my show. The publicist has a list of podcasts. They send me their generic template email and I'm like, oh shit, actually, yeah, I do want to interview that person. But it's it's very rare. And I don't know, there's also something about, I take pride in the curation and in my discernment. And I think that's one thing that I'm, there's many things in life I'm not good at, but knowing who I can have a really interesting conversation with is one of my skills. And so it's nothing personal if I don't, if I'm not interested in someone, I just don't get that feeling inside. You know, it's kind of like when you're attracted to someone, you, you can't explain it. I've been attracted to women in my life that I, if you show me a picture of them, I would say, oh, I don't find her attractive, but I'm in the same room with her. I'm very attracted or a friend or, you know, someone in business, like on paper, it would never make sense. And then you meet them and you're like, wow, I'm just, I'm really drawn to this person. I, I really enjoy their company. I enjoy speaking with them. I like sharing my experience with them. I love hearing their experience. We have a rapport. There's a compatibility. It's a chemistry thing, you know? And so my criteria is, do I have chemistry? Is there compatibility? Is there interest? Is there passion? And if that's not there, then I'm not doing it. Because it, why am I doing it then? To appease them or their publicist or to try to show off because I had a big name on my show. It's like, I don't care. I, I want to have conversations that make people, you know, the mind blown emoji. I want people to listen to my podcast and go, holy shit, what? You know, like, I never thought of that. I want to expand people's consciousness and awareness. I want people to be inspired like I'm inspired. And in order to do that, I've got to be really excited when I sit down and talk to someone or it's just, it's, it's dull. So that, you know, I yeah. think that's it's either a hell me. yeah or a no. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it's also it's it's been a process for me and a learning for me as a former people pleaser to like feel comfortable saying no and just being like, oh, you know, I just it's not aligned at this time. And, you know, we really appreciate you thinking of us and we'll keep it in mind, you know, um, but some people are super persistent. You know, I mean, sometimes it, people directly are persistent or their publicist is persistent. And I'm just like. I'm so sorry. You know, I'm just not interested. I got to, I have to have my, my boundary and know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And if, if one of the things I'm really good at is knowing when it's the right person, then I have to, I have to honor that gift and that, and that skill, you know, cause there have been times it's like, Oh, it's convenient or, you know, it's a friend of a friend or something like that. And I, I don't really feel that excitement. I'm like, ah, what the hell? It's not going to hurt. And halfway through the conversation, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, I'm bored. If I'm bored, the audience is going to be bored because it's all energy. They could feel that if I'm just going through the motions, asking questions, and it turns into like a standardized Q&A, they're not going to want to listen to that. I don't want to listen to that. I want to listen to a conversation between two people that are fired up and really into each other and really into the conversation and spontaneous magic is emerging as a result of that fire as a result of that excitement and passion. But but also sometimes you're guided to for the listener, but because you're meant to meet your soulmate that way, or because it, you're, you're, you're meant to save a family member's life by interviewing this person. That happened to me. I had Mark Nelson, very amazing, famous uh, psychic medium on uh, my show. Uh, several years ago, and he saved a family member's, my family member's life while doing the interview. Wow. So wow. Ryan inter uh, interrupts the conversation, uh, slips a piece of paper to me because she knows I'm talking to a, a psychic medium and asks a question 
of me to ask him, is so-and-so having a stroke? And yes, she is. And here's what's going to happen if she doesn't get to the hospital right away. Wow. And thankfully, because we knew with absolute certainty that this was a stroke, the guy is very credible. I just knew that this was true. And after much cajoling and begging and pleading and crying, got this person to go to the hospital, saved her life. Incredible. Wow. So sometimes you're just guided and you you don't know why. It's not about yeah. the conversation. It was yeah. a great episode. It was a, like, you should have him on your show. He'd be phenomenal. Send me a link. I'll listen to and, it. And Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this, uh, this was meant to be, I met him in a zoom breakout. Uh, we were in the same mastermind and metal Ken Rukowski's, uh, mastermind brotherhood together. And, uh, he's, I'm an ad guy, copywriter, and oh, I, I'm also a psychic medium and blah, blah, blah. What, 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 what was that part about psychic medium? <laughs> Tell me more. I just, it was electric. I felt like I had to have him on my show. I knew nothing about him yet. I never heard his name, never met him before, but within 30 seconds of meeting him, he's got to be on my show. And I had my whole calendar cleared because we were moving to Florida at the time. Uh, we ended up uh, changing plans and going to Israel instead, but I had no interviews scheduled. Three weeks, cleared the deck, and I'm like, I got to have you on now. Like we've got to figure out a time to do this in the next week or so. And it was exactly at the moment that this family member was having a stroke. Amazing. That's it, man. Yeah, that's it. It's the, it's the gut feeling, you know, it's like, I'm supposed to be doing this. That's it. I mean, I could have answered the question and, you know, <laughs> that succinctly. It just feels like it's supposed to happen. That would be another answer for it, you know? And yeah, sometimes, sometimes miraculous things happen, you know? Yeah. 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 Amazing. All right. Well, I had tons of questions, but we had a great conversation and you just shared so much uh, wisdom and value and realness. And I really greatly appreciate uh, you doing so. And I appreciate you as a, as a soul, a fellow soul on the, you know, we're all just walking each other home as Ram Das would say. And uh, yeah, I just really appreciate uh, having y you in my life and uh, yeah, thank you. Likewise, brother. Thanks for having me on and we'll do it again another time and get to your questions. I, you know, it's funny since my show is, so I'm just going to admit something since my show doesn't have time limits, I've really gotten accustomed to just kind of riffing and rambling. And if it's like flowing, I just flow and I don't think about it. If it goes four hours, fine. So I, I need to actually, it's good work for me. I need to remember if someone shows an hour to just be a bit more succinct and allow them to get to some of the things they want to get to. Cause I know there have been times when I interview someone and it's like someone I really want to talk to and someone that's usually bigger people. They might go, Hey, I'm going to give you, I don't know who you are. I'm going to give you an hour. And I'm like an hour, but I have 25 questions. It's at least three and a half hours worth of questions, you know? So it's, it's, it's good to be, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So it's, it's good as the guest, I have to, mm -hmm. you know, start to build that, that skill set of just like, allowing the conversation to get as much in as you want to get in during the time allotted, you know, but I appreciate you having me, man. Yeah. Yeah. You're awesome. So if our listener wants to follow you on social, listen to your podcast, become a subscriber or, or, uh, you know, long-term listener, where do you send them to? And also if they want to be part of your community, cause you have like a private Facebook group for people who listen to your show, like, uh, send them to all the cool places. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the, the rundown. So the main hub of everything I do in terms of content, and I would say the most value for free that you can get is the Lifestylist podcast, as we've been talking about, of course, and you can find that on all the platforms, as well as YouTube. You know, there, every podcast that I do has a YouTube uh, version as well. On social media, Instagram is my most active. I'm at Luke Story, S-T-O-R-E-Y. Uh, and then, yeah, I have a private Facebook group for listeners of my podcast. There's about like 7,000 people in there now. And I don't even get in there that much because I'll log in and people are answering the other members' questions in many cases better than I could. So it's like, it's a really well-educated, super sharp group of people in there. So it's, it's fun to see them just like a lot of really talented and gracious people in there. 
And you can find that just searching the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group. And then um, my main site is uh, lukestory.com. And uh, one thing that people enjoy about my site is I have an online store where I uh, link out to all of my recommended products in the realm of wellness and biohacking. So um, for about, uh, I don't know, 26 years or so, I've been researching the best of the best in all different products. And people started asking me, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? So much that I just decided to just put them all in one location on my store, which is, is essentially like a blog that's called a store. And so it's categorized according to the different products people might want. And that saves me from having to answer so many messages. I'm just like, you want to know the best water filter for your house? Go to the store and look under the water section. If it's there, I have it and like it and use it. And if it's not, then I've never heard of it or I don't like it. So yeah, my website is, uh, is the place where you can find all that. Yeah. And your YouTube channel is phenomenal too. You have videos where you go through, these are all the supplements I take. These are the ones that are my absolute go-tos. And these are the ones that are kind of nice to have, et cetera. Yeah. You've got such uh, great resources. Thanks brother. I appreciate it. All right. Well, listener, take this information and do something with it. Take action. We'll catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.